watch. You win, you lose. You lose. See, you said two. Turn on. How did you miss that one? Mac, what is magic? Oh, he sprung that on me. <laughs> uh, what is magic? Holy, why? We got right into it. Bam. Um, Jesus, I wish I had thought about this before we got here. <laughs> what is magic? It's the big, huge, impossible to answer question. What is magic? Um, um, I, don't, I don't think I have a really good answer for that. It's not an easy question. <laughs> hmm. Why would you start with that? Couldn't we just say, please state your name? And, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Difficult question, no? long answer, no? Can we start with an easier question? Good answer, Rob.
I have been trying for over half a century to come up with a succinct definition of magic. This is the best that I've managed thus far. Magic is the aesthetic exploration of mystery. But that's one of a many, many, many possible answers. I mean, magic is also uh, a hobby for a young person. Magic is also kind of a notion that used in advertising. Uh, magic is also the, the sensation of something larger than oneself for some people and the, you know, the, the wonder of the universe. But for me, it mostly boils down to a performance art of impossible things. What we do as conjurers and as performing magicians, as people that pretend to have magic powers, is apparently break the rules. And it's interesting because the rules are a shifting thing. They change all the time. You know, it's anything inexplicable, but uh, I heard a great uh, uh, definition. Ken Kesey, who was an amateur magician, the author, um, he said, uh, it's a single moment when a crack forms in your mind that lets the light in and it opens up all the possibilities. This is a very interesting idea. It's kind of a hopeful thing. Magic is a seduction because you are literally coming from the outside as a stranger and you are slowly, through what you're saying and what you're doing, sucking someone into your world, even if they don't want to necessarily go there at the beginning. Magic is the way to express the strength of それは例えば人間は弱いものだっていうことを心のどこかで思っているからこそ不思議な現象に憧れたりあとは祈ったりあとは、えー、何かを発明したり、えー、そういう、えー、何か科学的なこと、えー、美術的なことそういうことの発明のモチベーションになるものだと思っています。I'm a big fan of the Arthur C. Clarke quote where, you know, any technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. And, and to me, as someone who's also a big fan of science and technology, magic represents that alternative path where you can use science and technology to present something that, where, where the natural world seems to behave in ways where most people wouldn't expect it. Magic is uh, whatever science says is impossible. So magic is a moving target, always, because what's mysterious and amazing to people 2,000 years ago isn't mysterious and amazing now. If magic matters for, for one reason, it's that it provokes this experience of wonder. The problem with this experience of wonder is that wonder is spoken about in very woolly, fluffy ways, and people talk about shamanism and, and spirituality and all these and dancing around a pole and banging drums and, and all that wonderful stuff. And that's fine if you're into that, but it's really not necessary. We know it's not real, but it's, it's, a, it's a very concrete way of, of, a, of reminding us that we cannot be certain about what's around us, that we think we know, you know, oh, I, th I know why, how the light works. You sure about that? The main question is, is it necessary to see something to experience magic? Uh, it doesn't happen in your eye, the, mag the magic. It's very easy to get lost, to think you make an elephant appear, that it has to do with sight, you know, because it's so big, I wasn't there, and now I'm seeing it. And it, it's not impressive unless there is an interpretation underneath. If you also can reach into the emotional aspect of magic to, to create meaning or, or, or something that matters for the person, then, then you have truly an experience. I decided to, to research for things in which uh, the skill was not an explanation of things that could be done if you were able to do magic without elements. And for me, the moment I thought this, the most important part of the experience 
was that we were all going to be under the same conditions. The theater had to be dark, I had to be wearing a blindfold, and uh, because otherwise, uh, if I had a, any advantage, it wouldn't be magical. I did the show in Spain, and the sister of the King of Spain was there, and she's blind since she was born, so, uh, and she came to me after the show, it was, it was a very important moment, you know, but, but uh, she was so sweet, she, she came to me and she said that she wanted to thank me, and I said, why? And she said, uh, because before this moment, I never understood what a vanishing was, I never understood what was for something to disappear. For me, a beautiful things is like a family, for instance, in which one of the members is visually impaired or blind, and suddenly they, they feel the joy of sharing the same experience from the same point of view. For a moment, a brief moment, there was no difference between them. We're not used to understand the world around us without using sight, you know, and, and suddenly you realize that even when you're using sight, you are always creating interpretations. And that's why I think, I truly think that, that it, it is a question about, not magic for the blind, but, but the, the essence of magic for me. The one thing that makes magic special is that undeniable truth, that visceral experience. And as technology with television and special effects become more and more, you're going to see more people like Chris Angel and Dynamo who are illusions of an illusion. And, and, and to me, you know, if, if you can't trust that the people there are actually having that experience, if you can't trust that what you're seeing on the TV is actually what was happening, then there is no magic. It's, it's, it's a best a special effects show. And it's a stupid special effects show. What David Blaine did very successfully, uh, very cleverly, was to turn the camera on the audience. And so we're seeing people responding. They, they become our eyes and ears as if we were there. And I think that's a, a very clever move. I still think it's not quite the same as actually being there. You know, I mean, I think at its most basic magic is like, I just fooled you, bitch. <laughs> uh, but. The challenge is to make that, you know, not mean. I have, over time, come to understand that magic, maybe at its highest and best, is just another form of storytelling. And uh, a fundamental truth, I believe, of storytelling is that whoever tells the best story wins. I um, started magic very young, uh, five years old, maybe six, but I think five. I had a traveling dad. One time he came home, I'll never forget this, with a little plastic round, basically like a flat cylinder in two parts with a little lid on top and you lift it off the lid and there was a little gap in here with a piece of felt where you could, a nickel, a five cent, a nickel would fit right in there. And then you covered it with the lid and when you lifted it off, it had changed to a penny. And then you covered it with the lid again. And when you lifted it off, it had changed to a dime. And then he could hand you the lid and the little piece and the dime, and you could examine it. And that was the first, my very first contact with magic. On my next birthday, I got a box of plastic magic tricks, TV magic, Marshall Brodeen. And when you're a six-year-old kid with a top hat and a cape, that's, that's, you know, that's when the, the hook is sunk. There was a, a trick deck of cards, the TV magic cards advertised on TV, and I remember my grandmother dropping me off at the drugstore, and I ran in to get it, and she let, stayed at the curb. 
and I got the deck of cards and brought it back. I hadn't even taken it out of the package yet. But as we were driving down the street, I remember tapping it and holding it up to my ear, like, because the card was going to come to the top in this trick deck of cards. So I'd tap it and I'd listen, because I expected to hear, it, like, ring, like gears and all kind, you know. But it's that imagination. That's part of the thing that appealed to me. I wasn't involved in magic. I saw a movie about a Mississippi Riverboat gambler. And I said, that's what I want to be. I saw the Derringer hat and the brocade vest and dealing those cards. And it appealed to me. I went to a used bookstore, and the only book I could find was The Expert at the Card Table by S.W. Erdnase. That became my, my book. After four years, I came to the Rude Awakening. There weren't a lot of places for a 12-year-old card cheater to work. When I was a child, four or five years old, I asked my father to bring, bring me to a magic show. From this moment until now, I, uh, I am uh, 70 years old. Or every day, I am fascinated with magic. I don't know why. I was nine years old, and I went uh, and visited my cousin John, and John had a little set of three quarter inch multiplying billiard balls. And he says, hey, Mike, look at this. Boom, two balls, boom, three balls. And it was amazing. And he said, here, you can have these. And that was the moment. Now, what's amazing to me is that John just gave that away and sort of never gave it another thought. And that the moment I got it, it completely changed my life. I think I probably was drawn to magic for the same reason that most young boys are. Uh, magic turns out to be a very practical coping mechanism for dealing with some form of social and or psychological maladjustment. There's something that enters your consciousness before a certain age and it's you're you're vulnerable toward being bitten hard by this fascination and the the allure of being able to do the impossible and there is just something about that world of trickery deceit lies uh, that, that is if, if you if you have that type of mindset and it's really hard to say what it is but if you've got it you know you're in the right place one day I was invited to the magic castle I walked into that building and I said this is where I belong I don't it's I don't know why but because first of all it's a nightclub you have to dress up and you drink and I don't like doing either one of those things. Something about the building that was this old Victorian building and the, the atmosphere and everything so I was so fascinated that the next day I called the Magic Castle and actually spoke to Bill Larson, the man that runs the Magic Castle, and I said um, I'm a mime and I would like to know how I can work at the Magic Castle and he very kindly said to me well to work at the Magic Castle you have to be a magician and I paused and I said, oh, really? My father died when I was young and the guys that ran the local magic shop felt pity for the, the kid who lost his dad. And they said, well, you can come work at our magic shop, but here's what it, you, you don't get paid and all you get to do is vacuum the floor and clean the birdcage. I jumped at it, I loved it. And what the opportunity for me was to hang out with these guys, to learn, and when there were no customers, which was most of the time, I got to read magic books. So magic shops, at least from my personal perspective, are very important for the people that work there. How important they are in today's culture as a meeting place or a place where the culture and the, and the information is transferred, I'm not sure. I don't think they are all that important for someone who wants to be a performing magician. However, they have been really important to the culture of magic. あの、
Tannen's Magic is the uh, oldest magic store, certainly in New York City, and uh, one of the oldest in the country, in the world, I guess. My name is Adam Blumenthal. I'm the owner of Tannen's Magic. Tannen's has been here since 1925, and obviously there's a lot of New York magicians and magicians all over the place who grew up at Tannen's and have fond history of, and memories of all the different locations we've had. Uh, I think any brick and mortar magic store is really kind of essential in the growth of any local magic community, but uh, Tannen's especially. I think the attraction is the ability to, one, walk in here and feel some history. We've moved five times um, since 1925, so there's been quite a few different locations and not everyone started coming here, but you walk in and you see a lot of old pieces, you see a collection of our old books that we published. We have a library um, that people can borrow things from, so you get to come in and really see things firsthand and touch things. Historically, uh, Tannins was really catering towards professional magicians, and uh, you'd come in to buy your props for you know, the latest road show. Um, now it's much more of an amateur audience. I think professional magicians at this point are not buying props as much in a, in a local magic store. Uh, we have anyone coming in from four-year-olds up to I think the oldest customer I've ever met here was 97. Um, and you know, we don't, we're not on the street, we've never been on the street, so you've got to know we're here. It's kind of a hangout place. Magic shops are incredibly important, and I really believe that as magic shops disappear, the culture of magic starts to disappear. So for me, it was Tannins. When I was a kid, I used to drive into the city, go to Tannins, go up in the elevator, and see Tony and try to understand what Tony was saying. Um, and there were certain guys that hung out in the shop. Bob Elliott was there and like, that's a real magician. People will walk into a magic shop and the guy behind the counter might be a master, somebody that other magicians would travel the well to spend five minutes with. There are increasingly few of these places and now most of the interaction is taking place online. Uh, it's a different thing. It isn't as good. インターネットはただ売るだけです。コミュニケーションありません。で、え、マジックは、え、見せてコミュニケーションを取って気に入ったかいらないかで売ります。じゃないと買った人が満足しません。I don't think magic shops are like they used to be, but the world's not like it used to be. Uh, the way people congregate is now ethereal, it's on the internet, it's not in person many times. Oh, I really miss being able to go into the magic shop and saying to the guy behind the counter, what's that and what's that? Because there are few and far between now. And even those that, that are around are often now staffed by magicians who don't really know deeply the, their product line. They know the latest thing, but if you point at something that was released four years ago, it's been in the counter and gathering dust. You go, what is that? They go, I don't know. <laughs>
the world of magic is incredibly welcoming, incredibly nurturing. It's almost like a foster family. And if you're, if you've ever been someone that's felt different or alienated or in any way not accepted, magic is this amazing safe haven. Magic is one big family, but it's a really dysfunctional one. And we're all just trying to get by and create new tricks and, and uh, you know, hopefully perform for the, the public and entertain them. But within that, you have an enormous amount of diversity. You'll have people like the ex-director of the Central Intelligence Agency, people who are the CEOs of gigantic Wall Street investment banks who are very wealthy, billionaires, uh, sitting and talking to people who, they're students or, you know, uh, sanitation engineers. The community of Maji is like a community of children. There are illusion, there are enjoyment, we, we, we want, we like very much to be together. For this, there are a lot of conventions and dinner together. All, all the time, magicians are together. In the other field of performance, usually it's not like this, usually, no? I've been an orchestrator, a musician, an, an actor, a comic, and a magician. But there's nothing like magic, you know? I've been stranded in Europe and I find a magician there and I, I'm, I'm, I need a prop or something, and they're there. I don't like the idea of the public thinking that, that magicians as a group are all kind of egomaniacs that are trying to outdo each other all the time with each other's biggest tricks or, or, or being really catty about each other behind each other's backs, because I don't, that's not my magic. That's not what I feel about magic. But it is there, you know, and I suppose it's there in the same way that you know, whoever wins the Turner Prize, every other artist wants to say something negative about them. My favorite thing about magic, I love performing, I love being a magician, I love being fooled by magic, everything we've been talking about, but really the best thing is the collection of people that magic has brought me in touch with and, and put in my life. It's the, the best gift that magic could give me. Magic saved my life. Did it? Yes. You want to talk about it? Yeah. Since I can remember, I wanted to be an entertainer. I wanted to be a performer. And I wanted to be a musical performer. When I was really young, my dad was uh, used to have to watch the kids sometimes, and that was never fun. That was my single goal, my single focus in life. That's what I woke up in the morning and thought about. That's what I went to sleep thinking about. My mom was working at night in a, a, a bowling alley, and so he would often take us up to the bowling alley, and we would stay in the nursery all night, and he would go in the bar, and my mom would work or whatever. And uh, but once I, I, I somehow I ended up in this wrong door, the nursery, I was next to it, and uh, they had guard dogs there that they would let loose in the bowling alley at night. For many of those years, I couldn't or didn't go on stage without the aid of drugs or alcohol. And when I saw the dead end with music and what that was going to be, I thought my life was over. I don't remember a thing, uh, but I was attacked by one of the dogs. The bulldog, he kind of bit me in, um, he tore right from here, this part of my mouth open. And because of that, I, water gathers in my mouth as a kid. My tongue was always swollen. Uh, I had a very difficult time with speech. You know, I kid, I had six and a half years of the plastic surgery, the, the, the one that makes you handsome. So one uh, very hot uh, summer afternoon in the mid-90s, uh, we loaded our gear into a nightclub in uh, downtown Baltimore. And I'm looking for a place to cool off. And it could be anywhere. It could be a women's shoe store, a mattress shop, but it wasn't. Uh, the place that I stepped into was called Kenzo's Yogi Magic Mart. On a Saturday, I went by a McDonald's and there was Ronald McDonald was doing the Miles from Smiles show, or something, I think it was the name of it. And there was a man named Tommy Hart performing as Ronald McDonald. But after about 10 minutes, I started feeling guilty for essentially loitering. So I asked this guy, the, only, the single person in the shop, uh, if he had a trick that I might be able to perform at, at a little nightclub down the street. And he said, what about this? And he reached in his pocket and he took out a little handkerchief and he pushed into his fist like this, said presto changeo, and it was gone. It was unbelievable. I, I couldn't believe what I saw. And I also couldn't believe that the trick was for sale. He did this uh, 
uh, what was called the Gene Anderson paper tear, but he did that paper tear where he tore a paper up. And, and I was watching, I was like, no, what in the world did I just see? That night, we're about three songs into our set. There's a couple hundred people in the audience. And uh, our guitar player broke a string. And I can't tell you why, but I immediately remembered this device that I had in my front right pocket to, to vanish a small object. And he goes, oh, son, you just got to get the books and you read the books and get a bunch of magic books. And I remember dropping my eyes and kind of walking away. And he goes, like, what's wrong? And I, you know, I go, well, I, I'm not a good reader. And uh, uh, I don't know uh, what happens at that moment or whatever, but he said, he goes, wait to, wait a minute, and uh, let me talk to you. So everybody left, and, and he, he said, it's okay. He, and he showed me how to put a card behind my hand and, and the back ball. And he goes, if you can learn that, I can teach you anything, everything I've done. I grabbed the mic and I blurted, uh, who has a, who's got a condom out there, or a wrapped condom? And no time somebody threw one on stage, picked it up, opened it up, and very crudely, I put that condom in my fist and it vanished. And that crowd went crazy. For a week, I couldn't wait till the next Saturday to McDonald's. So I go there and there he is performing in the whole show. I'm in the back, back palm and hiding a card during the whole show. I know he rolled his eyes a hundred times, but I'm just saying, you've got to see me. Uh, I can do that and I'm ready for the next lesson. I came back to LA and uh, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, had a pass to the Magic Castle and we went. And from the second that I said open sesame to that owl and walked into that main bar, the Grand Salon, I fell in love with magic. What Tommy did for me at that time was he gave me my vehicle. You know, it's the, it's the moment I become alive is when I'm on stage. Now, 15 years later, I am very proud to be a part of this, this community. I was kind of like going 90 miles an hour to a dead end, into a dead end. And then all of a sudden, there was an off-ramp <laughs> that just sort of like opened up, and there, and there it was. And here I am. Uh, magic saved my life. There's, there's no way to, to, to go about that. I mean, I am who I am because of magic. Maybe the greatest piece of magic I've ever seen was when I was 13 years old. I went to my first magic convention, and there was a guy there named Jack Channon. In performance, he took a, a lit cigarette, which he was smoking, and, and clearly, from the smoke and the lit embers, it was the real thing, and he put it into his fist. Everything looked like it should. I mean, you thought, my God, he's got a burning cigarette in his hand. And then he slowly uncurled one finger, and he slowly uncurled another, and somewhere right around this point, it dawned on every member of the audience, each in his own moment, not simultaneously, that as Jack was studying his hand in the process of opening it to show it empty, he was smoking the cigarette. The hair on the back of my neck stood up at that time, and it just did now. To create magic, yeah, I wanted to be at that level that they have no other answer than it has to be magic. How could he do that, you know? I love it. I, honestly, I really, really love it. I mean, that is the ultimate achievement for me when I see my audience smile and it, they're just completely taken by the magic that I just performed and they perceive it as a miracle. For me, my personal goal is to move people to a point of uncertainty and genuine uncertainty. So I'm not interested in them necessarily believing magic is real or, or them questioning whether the magic is real. I'm really interested in moving them to a place where they're not sure. And I think if you can do that, you create a real moment of magic. It's a two-way thing that I'm just as astonished at what happens as my spectator. There are many emotions that I'm trying to evoke that things that I, I've been there, I've, I've had those emotions myself as a, as a spectator, and I want them to feel the same. And, and sometimes when I do a show, I find a window, an opportunity to do something that I could have never done before. And it's only true for that moment. My field professionally is magic. So it becomes up to me a way to create effects, tricks, whatever you want to call them, 
that will transfer that feeling of awe to an audience. I mean, magic is supposed to be uh, saying all the time, everything is possible, and, and what can be better than that? We know it's not real, it's a metaphor, but it reminds us that limitations are an illusion. For me, magic has absolutely changed how I see the world and interact with it. Magic has to cross that line from just being wondrous and magical to being impossible or it isn't magic. I want you to go away thinking, no one ever saw what I just saw. No one. Like you can pay me no amount of money that can replace that feeling that I get, the reward of causing a miracle to happen. Life, that eh? Ikikata. I know that I am at my most joyful without wanting to sound kind of new agey or happy clappy. I am at my most joyful when I am performing magic and when I'm proud of the magic I'm performing. And I also know that I'm at my most depressed and unhappy when I'm performing it badly. One of my favorite phrases is the Devant poster, you know, laughter born of amazement. And, you know, I, I want the magic to be so powerful that eventually the only reaction left to people is laughter. I want them to be entertained through the performance of magic or, or mystery entertainment. And uh, my goal is to both produce a sense of wonder for them, an enjoyable sense of wonder, and very specifically, I want them to have a, a non-threatening sense of uncertainty. If you put somebody at a point of them really not knowing, really being uncertain, Suddenly, you have an entire room full of people at exactly the same place at exactly the same time. It doesn't matter about what they thought when they came in the room. It doesn't matter what they'll think when they leave the room. In that moment, we are all connected in our not knowing. You get to a point where you've shown them something very personal, and they also respond to you in a, on a very personal level. They're, they're not detached from it. And I feel the experience of really something that is not possible, incredible, I won, it happened, it's not, yeah, but it's not possible. And at the same time, the impossible thing in my mind and the fascinating thing in my soul. And this is the experience of magic, this both thing together, yes? Uchi no okakusan wa, kuro okakusan wa, iron na hito ga kimasu. Tatoeba, shigoto de shippai o shita hito to ka,え、people kind of come see magic very defensive. You know, they put their guards up because they don't, people don't like to be fooled. It's common sense. If I were to come up to you and, you know, raise my arm to punch you, you'd obviously defend yourself. I think it's allowing the people to feel comfortable to take their defense down and just to embrace what, what's about to happen. It's not at all about them wondering how it was done. I don't want them to think how it was done. I just want them to get that feeling that they can't explain. As soon as they start to figure out how I did a trick, then I think I failed. And I want them to almost give up on the trying to figure out how the magic trick works. And just, you know, if you pound them enough, it's just like, well, shit, I don't know. People really adore good magic. They may resist at first when they don't know there's such a thing as good magic. But once they realize that what they're going to see is great, you very rarely see an audience turn away or not beg for more. I think that magicians do their best to convince themselves and others that magic is an art form, but I think that like almost any endeavor, it, it can or cannot be an art depending upon how artfully it's being performed or executed. Every form that, that you can use to express yourself, if it's used right, 
is art. I mean, there are painters who, who paint and they're not artists, and there are people who sculpt and they're not artists. And the same applies to magic. Matisse used to say that the most difficult thing to paint is, is a rose, because every person has done it. How can you paint a rose again and give it your own voice? There are people who can turn carpentry into an art, who can turn the art of the tea ceremony into something that is transcending regularly drinking tea, which you can do anywhere. And it's the same with magic. There's people who are artists and who can transform what they are doing. I know some magicians that are quite artful and who I would consider artists, but I think at large, and it's not a negative thing, that a lot of people who practice magic, that they've seen someone else perform, or they've learned from a book, or they've learned from another person, them performing it, just the act of doing it, um, does not necessarily make it art or them artists. You know, there's an art in picking a repertoire. There's an art in putting pieces together in an order. I mean, I can create a playlist or a mixtape that makes you feel something. And there's creativity involved in that. Is it important to do all original material? Absolutely not. But I think the more you become in tune to your own personal voice and your strengths and weaknesses, the more original your material becomes. You know, you were told in books, you know, you, uh, I read as a kid, you know, it's not about the trick, it's about the performer. It's not about the trick, it's about the performer. I only want to be an entertainer. I don't care about the magic. And, you know, you know, as I've gotten more and more into it, I mean, I think that's bullshit. I mean, you know, the tricks really do matter. The tricks really matter. Last night I saw Matt King's show. Matt King did a lot of things that people could say, well, that's a classic. But the way Matt does it, the way he performs it, makes it his very own. Even if somebody had just seen one of those pieces performed by somebody else, they probably wouldn't even recognize it. The most important, the most, most important is the persona of the magician. Of course, for me, no, no question. The most important is the persona. If I like the persona, I can go through the persona and I can... But if, if the persona, the, the, I don't like and it's just, uh, then the magic don't, don't come to me, it's like a... I mean, all of these things are wonderful pieces, but that's just a part of it. And some, sometimes it's a big part, but more important, it's a small part because it's what the magician, the performer brings to the table that makes that thing work. All performing, all art is like being seen in the proper light. There was an example on YouTube, they put Joshua Bell, the great violinist, in the subway and he's playing beautiful music and people are walking by him just like he's some other guy in the subway. But if he was in the concert hall, I mean, people would be standing up and applauding and they'd be all dressed up and they'd pay hundreds of dollars for the tickets. But because he was not in the proper light, people didn't appreciate it in the same way. My picture's up on a truck that drives up and down Las Vegas Boulevard with my giant head on it. But still, somehow, in people's minds, that's the same as the guy who's, you know, who's, uh, you know, cut out homemade business card is stuck on the wall at the Dairy Queen in their neighborhood, you know, offering, you know, children's birthday parties for twenty-five dollars. 僕が参加劇場に来る時、お客さんがマジックのショーに来る時に、その時に来る理由っていうのは必ずあると思います。で、僕もえ、そのマジックをやる理由っていうのは必ずあると思います。つまり僕がいつも同じマジックをやっている、
at the same time, we do, the magician, we do to the people say, impossible, it's a, it's logically impossible. Cannot be done, it cannot exist this. This is an experience that, oh, perhaps I am dreaming because it's not true, not possible. But at the same time, you are feeling, ah, impossible, I'm feeling, no? Intellectual and emotional. In our field, many people died prematurely, and there's this big gap between the young and the masters. And the person who has filled that gap is Juan Tamariz, who is the most revered magician in the world at this moment. In the suffered, the, the <laughs> it happens anywhere between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. after late night dinner and lots of booze. And then he pull, takes his mat out and his car. Says, ah. Maybe, perhaps, something crazy, shuffle. And, and then he goes into this, you know, half an hour, an hour of magic, and it blows your mind. And I, I think every person who got to be there at least once in his lifetime is lucky. When you really start to get to know Juan on a personal level, there was a kind of a breakthrough to where I started to get the, the real knowledge from the man. You want to talk about history, he knows so much about history. If you want to have a, a theoretical discussion about what the concept of magic is, of course he's going to have many, many very interesting opinions. And then when you see him perform, you understand how everything comes to life. Juan is at once the most knowledgeable and the most giving of all card magicians. To be serious in card magic today, in 2013, you have to go to Madrid and you have to study with Juan Tamariz. <laughs> For me, uh, I think there are seven veils of mystery. The mystery of the love, because if you don't love your art, you, mm, you cannot express yourself, you cannot express something with you, without love. It's very, very important to love the passion of the art. The audience, how they know that this man or this woman love magic, really. They know, but how they know is a mystery for me. The second one for me is the mystery of the knowledge. If you know more about this trick, about the, the author, about him, about the history of the tree, and the more you know, more you, magic is more deep for the people, and the people feel this. How they feel and how, I don't know. It's another mystery, the second and third one for me, the mystery of the work. More work you put in an effect, in a trick, in an illusion, in a dream, more strong and more reaction, and more deep reaction, and more remain in the feeling and the emotion of the spectator. How they know that you put more effort, more work? They don't know, but they feel, and this is a mystery. Another one is the, the mystery of the energy. Sometimes we perform, I perform in other magician with only this in a theater of 1,500 people, and the last one must feel the energy you have, not only physical, but also Spiritual, spiritual inside, you know. And the five uh, mystery for me is the mystery of the true. Of course, the art in general is not true, it's a fiction, no? not the real life. In magic, especially, no? especially, you are lying, lying all the time, saying, uh, do this, I don't know this, I have not here nothing, but you have hiding something, something or something. But 
The more true is the thing that you do, more true people feel this, and I don't know how they feel, but they feel, and this is the five mystery. This mystery is the interior world, more rich is the your interior world, more people like your magic, more they feel your magic. Interior world, there is no interesting, you can be a good communicator, a good showman, but not a good artist, it's not, so the, it's not the same. And the seventh mystery for me is the mystery of love, but I told the first is love, and the last one is love. I think it's important, the love to the audience, to the other people, because it's not only a question to, I do this and you applaud me, it's not the most important. The most important is the love to the other, no? And the love to the audience is all seven mysteries that I don't know. I don't know how they know, but they know. Sure, sure. They are the, for me, seven veils that cover seven mysteries in magic, and for me they are very important. What's funny is, once you kind of get a grasp of his theory, anytime I have a show that doesn't go over very well, it's not very good, I can go back through it and I can find that one of the veils was missing tonight. I did not have an, enough energy with me. It was kind of a low energy performance. It is absolutely fascinating that an audience can pick up on things that we're really not aware of as performers. So they can smell I mean, what, what, what lecturers call authenticity. When somebody really knows their topic inside out, upside down, you can just tell it. And, and, and someone else, an actor, could say exactly the same words, but you just know they don't really know it. And you can't quite put your finger on what it is. It really connected with me because there is something deeper where you do need to have a love for what you're doing, love for the audience, and people can feel it. Howard Thurston would go out and before every single performance, he would go behind the curtain and look out into the audience and clasp his hands together and say in a whisper, I love you, I love you, I love you. I found something very special about that. For me, it doesn't come alive until somebody is there to experience it because I think underneath all of it, underneath everything about magic, the only thing that matters is the emotion that it creates. That's what makes it matter. That's what makes it important, and that's what makes it unique in all forms of art. The magic happens in the minds of the audience, and what a magician is really doing is fully controlling what the audience perceives and how they think about what they are perceiving. And all of these things that magicians do, like letting you examine the props, like rolling back their sleeves, like showing you that their hands are empty. This is all part of that process of elimination to take away one by one all of the things that you think are maybe how the trick works. And when there's nothing left, when you've eliminated every possible method and you still see something happen that's impossible, you feel magic. When you pick up that cup and there's a ball under there, it's a freaking ball under a cup. It's not, there's nothing special about that. The secret of magic is not how do I get the ball under the cup. The secret to magic is how do I make this room full of people care that there's a ball under the cup and react en masse as this is the most important thing they've ever seen. You can study a very, a very complex thing, the technical point of view, the psychological, the artistic, the illusion, the how to communicate, the how to put to the other, the, a lot of interesting thing, so many, many, many things, so different many things, because you have the passion. If not, it's not possible to be an artist because magician, because you don't, you don't give nothing. No? All of us who are struggling to try and create good magic are struggling with these same unknowables. Uh, we can all try our best to codify them and identify them and analyze them. I think there are limits. I think sometimes after all of the discussion and all of the, the, the careful dissection, you just have to go out and do it.
the extraordinary accomplishment of the magicians of the 20th century is that they managed to take something that is inherently profound and render it trivial. And I guess that's the thing that bothers me the most, you know. When I see somebody who didn't put the time and the, the thinking and, and the work that goes into being a real magician. The problem with, with bad magic, what makes it bad is that there is no connection between the performer and the audience. There's no sense that the performer knows what he or she is doing. I can remember seeing a soaring in half, I won't mention names, where the woman uh, got into the box and uh, a pair of feet emerged from the bottom of the box, which were clearly wooden. They were clearly wooden feet. They were clearly not human feet at all. And no one in the audience believed that these feet were human feet, because even if you had um, very, very bad sight, you would, you would know. Even if you were almost registered blind, you would know they were wooden feet. And the magician carried on. He, he saw the, the woman in half and, and separated the boxes, and everyone was thinking, but she's in that box, and there's a pair of wooden feet there. Uh, no one was fooled. It was pathetic. And it was probably one of the most enjoyable moments of my life. So I think we are a kind of a low-hanging fruit. You know, it's easy to make fun of magicians, and I'm not sure that that's completely, you know, undeserved. I mean, when I started doing magic for money, the place I worked most was in a comedy club. The comics hated us. They had worked with other magicians, and those magicians are the kind of magicians who buy a trick from the magic shop and do it as the directions tell you. And with the jokes that are printed in the directions. And these guys have, you know, they do their act and they record it every night and then they go back to their hotel room and they listen to it and they write and they change one word and do it again the next night, you know, with that one word different. And, you know, they're polishing and working and, you know, working their butts off on their act. And so to see a guy getting laughs with, a, with, a, with jokes he didn't write and tricks he didn't invent, you know, that irks them. And rightly so, really. We treat our audiences often disrespectfully. We treat them as props. We use jokes that weren't funny 50 years ago, and we, they still aren't funny now. We do a lot of the same tricks. We do a lot of the same tricks the same way. And I can't blame an audience member for when they're hearing, oh, we have a magician, thinking, oh, God, not one of those. Normally, you see a magician wandering around a restaurant performing tricks, and they won't be particularly good, or it'll be a clown at a birthday party or something like that. And, and the public tend to base their, their ideas about magic on those individuals. That's not especially surprising. Most of those people are not particularly good, um, and, and so the public don't hold magic in you know, especially high regard. Anytime a layman sees a magician perform, uh, it's interesting that they don't just make up an opinion about that person that they saw, they make up their opinion about magic in general. That shouldn't happen. From outside of magic looking in, you seem to see a lot of the same stereotypes that have been around for a hundred years. Tuxedos, rabbits from hats, I think that people outside of magic still think that that is some of what magic is, or a lot of what magic is. And of course, from the inside of magic, nothing could be further from the truth. The image of the magician, sadly, is for most of the public a cliché that involves something nice for children. Uh, judging magic through that filter is like judging music solely based on how people sing in the shower.
I think being a magician is almost the hardest thing you can do. And people always question that. You know, well, what do you mean by that? And I'm dead serious. Oftentimes in lectures I have said, you want to be a brain surgeon? It's easy. You go to college, you go to medical school, and you go to brain surgery school, and then you get a job in a hospital and they teach you exactly what to do, exactly where to cut, exactly where to saw the guy's head open. You're a brain surgeon. How do you become a magician? I have no idea. So Maddie Gilbert is a, um, a young magician, relatively new to sleight of hand, who has embraced it in a way where he invents all his own sleight of hand. And this is very special. If not unique in magic, it's extremely rare. Here's a guy, a young guy, that discovered magic. And, and I think that he needed magic, and now I would say as much as magic needs Maddie. One day, in the convention, and we say, ah, you know Maddie? And he did, I'm going to do something for you very shy at the, at the first moment, no? Because, you know, and I, oh, and I like it, especially the thing that he throw from here, no? And we were going out for Chinese food. It was me and Michael Weber and Jim Steinmeier and Max Maven and Eric Mead and just all these heavy hitters. And at the end of the table is this young guy. And everybody was fixated on him. Everybody was talking to him. Weber's like down on the floor working with him on some card trick or something and Mead can't stop talking about him. I think Steinmeier said it was the most amazing thing he had seen in a long time. I one time had an argument about Maddie with somebody else who said, well, yeah, but there's lots of magicians like Maddie. And I said, no, there really are no other magicians like Maddie. There's a great quote in Tarbell. It goes, what magic requires of you, it gives you. So it's not a question of, um, you know, believing in yourself or having faith in yourself. If you take a course of actions and you do it, it will happen. It's not, oh, I'm practicing five hours a day or eight hours a day. I'm pretty much thinking about it all day long. I sort of had to become self-sufficient at a very early age. You know, there, there's no magic books written for me. So it's me reading stuff that's completely not for me and having to figure out ways. I think that every performer is in the same situation as me, but they don't realize it because it's not so obvious. They have to figure that out for themselves. Real magic does exist in a way because you can really make anything happen from nothing. For me, magic has absolutely changed how I see the world and interact with it. Started a cycle of events almost that un unfolded by themselves. Almost magical. Almost magically. <laughs>most of the non-magicians who've attempted to explore magic either on film or video or on the printed page have not done a very good job uh, but that's because they they usually are attempting to accomplish something in a matter of months that takes many years there are neuroscientists that believe that they're going to solve their own study of neuroscience by studying magicians I personally think they're on the wrong track. I think that we're, we're more about applied psychology than we are about the structure of the brain itself. The problem with the, the psychology, and worse still, the neuroscience of magic, is that magic is complicated. Scientists have regularly attempted to come up with th grand theories of magic, and they haven't gone anywhere, and there's a reason for that. Magic is not a natural kind. It's not the stuff of science. It's not like a rock or a tree. Magic is about human interaction and it draws upon cultural stuff, language and meaning. And without that, you don't have it. 
neuroscientists and the uh, people that have been thrown out of magic conventions that go on to write tell-all articles and books, uh, they don't know what they're talking about. So they can only pretend to tell. And it, they can write it in a fraudulent sort of an entertaining, appealing way. But in, in fact, it's nothing. It's, it's lascivious. It's not the real thing. A good magic trick is like a soap bubble. It's a thin layer of iridescent soap suspended equidistant from a single point in space, floating carelessly through the wind, delicate to the world. And when you find out the trick, you pop that bubble and it goes from this beautiful special orb to a wet spot on the ground. You have people who stand up and say, here's the real secret of magic. And then what they tell you makes it perfectly obvious to anyone who actually knows about magic that they don't know what the real secret is. Exposes of magic, like the masked magician, they're cheap, they're tawdry, they're insulting, they're stupid. And that's beyond the ethics of the matter. I dislike exposure, first of all, because it's rude. The people who expose magic do not know if it's going to be harmful to magic. In fact, I don't think it's harmful in the larger picture. But I don't think the people who expose know that or care. It's more just mean-spirited. It's, it's more, well, why, why'd you do that? You know, it's like sort of spitting in the street. There's probably no massive harm, but it's like, what'd you do that for? I don't think many people would go and watch a stand-up comedian and moments before entering the theatre listen to that comedian's show on, on a download or something to, to rob themselves of the laughter, right? They, nobody walks into a comedian wanting to know the punchline. Jay Marshall used to say, those that know don't tell and those that tell don't know. And the man in the mask doesn't know. He only tells. He doesn't have any idea what he's talking about. And in, in no way can magic be exposed in this fashion because it's such a deep psychological game that you can't possibly expect to understand how it works because you know where a trap door is. In a left-handed sort of way, I think that show kind of helped magic in that it, it made uh, people talk about magic. And I don't know what uh, your experience was, but a lot of people would love to talk to me and say, wow, what do you think about the mass magician and the exposure and all of that? So it kind of brought it back to the surface, so to speak. I wish people didn't have access to that information. But on the other hand, you know, it's just a trick. It is just a trick. My friend Jim Steinmeier said it best. He said, magicians protect an empty safe. Laymen think that we have in some old salt mine in a mountain somewhere a big steel door that's locked tight and with armed guards out in front and all the great secrets of magic are in this vault. And if they somehow got through that door and went in there, there'd be a, a piece of thread and a little mirror le leaning up against the wall and a rubber... And they go, Where, where's all the secret? Well, this is it. I was working on a television special where we needed to create a specific levitation effect or an animation effect. And we had a really nice method. It was very simple. It was based on something Al Baker came up with a long time ago. And it was incredibly simple, incredibly deceptive. And I showed the director, and he loved it. And he asked me how it was done. And because it was integral to getting the shot right, I told him, it's a string. I'm pulling this string, you just don't see it. And when he found out the method, he dismissed the effect because it wasn't interesting enough. And no matter how I tried to explain to him that the method was totally irrelevant to what we were trying to capture on film, it just, that bubble had burst for him. Blue pill, red pill. If you can only choose one, which would you choose? With the blue pill, you know all the secrets to magic and you can never return. With the red pill, you will always live in the fantasy world, in the world that you believe it to be. It's impossible to go back. You can never, it's a spoiler. It's, 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 I mean, maybe that's even a better way to talk about it with people. It's like, do you want to know the end of Breaking Bad or do you want to watch the whole show and experience those emotions? Maybe some people want to know. It's a hard question. I personally have offered this pill to some of my workers, my friends, because it's part of the nature of my business. And a lot of the times, people come to me afterwards, people who took the blue pill, 
and say, Cyril, I can never go back. However, they say to me that they have a whole new appreciation for the art of magic. There are types of tricks where I think the secret really can be quite interesting and they tend to be more uh, psychological and optical and a little bit like lateral thinking puzzles where you go, ah, oh, I can't believe I didn't think, oh, that's, that's lovely. And so with the mystery of the red cards, you simply see somebody show both sides of uh, two pieces of red cardboard and then they're put together and a small toy car appears. And it appears to be completely impossible because you can see all the angles, you can see under the table, that there's nothing there that looks suspicious. So the origins of that clip actually come from a, a charity shop where I uh, went in and found a, a little car with optical sensors on the front and cost about £2.50. And the car simply follows a black line on a table. And my immediate thought, and I think this is what, what's interesting about magic, most people look at that and go, oh, that's kind of a fun toy. Magicians never do that with anything, nothing. Everything they pick up, they go, that's interesting. So if you looked at it from this angle, it, look, it looks quite different. I thought if you've got two screens and you show one, uh, there's nothing behind one, and the car is behind the other, and then the car moves behind the first screen, and then that allows you to show the other car, I think people would assume there's no car there at all because they're not assuming you've got an object moving behind screens. Why? Because in everyday life, objects don't move like that. I think the clip is a nice example of how magic works. You see something which looks incredible and you're being tripped up by a really simple assumption and a huge amount of work. Quickology is about exciting people and making them curious about the world and making them realize, like a good magic trick, that what you have in your head at any one moment is a construction. It's not an accurate representation of the world. It's just the way you see things. And because it's just the way you see things, it means that you can perhaps change how you see things. You can see the world in a different way. And that's the underlying message to quirkology. In that sense, it's absolutely identical to magic. You know, there are several great uh, magic collections uh, around the world, and of course, Ken Klosterman's is one of the great ones. Kenny is one of those guys who loves magic more than anything. You know, I've accumulated a lot of magic over the years. I mean, I like to see the, the things that the performer used. When you go to John Gons and see what he has created, uh, it is completely unique. I always love going there and I always feel like a brand new kid interested in magic when I walk into that special little room. I appreciate it for its craftsmanship and uh, the ingenuity that went into making all those things and the fact that some man spent all that time just for a magic trick. What was, a, was an audience thinking? when they saw something like that. Well, I only share my collection with magicians, okay, or someone who's knowledgeable about magic. And my reason, I guess, is very selfish because I hope to learn about some of the things I have. There are so many things in this collection that are so unique Ideally, I would love to take everything in this house and put it back where I found it so that the next guy could have that same thrill. My specialty or my passion, you might say, 
are, are the mechanical figures called automata. And one of the pieces in here is the uh, automaton chess player, which was built in, in Vienna around 1769. Now, that piece was the product of a magician. And all across Europe uh, came the word that, not that they've made a chess playing machine, but they had made a thinking machine. It captured the imagination of whole populations in different cultures. This concept of a robot, the word didn't exist yet, but, but the idea of an automaton, a self-realized mechanical creature that could actually function in a game of chess. That influenced a lot of people to, to start thinking and saying, well, if, if somebody can come up with the right combination of gearing and everything to do something that would play chess, I should be able to make uh, uh, something that would weave material, like Eli Whitley and the Cotton Gin. We know that one of the people who was inspired by the Turk was Charles Babbage, the British uh, mathematician who essentially created the computer. He actually made a, a calculating machine. I think it's in the British Museum in London. He was influenced uh, strongly by the chess player. I'm sure that all of our technology, or at least a lot of the start of all of our technology, owes its uh, allegiance to a magician. Magicians have been the popularizers of science since the beginning of science. Um, some of the first people to codify how science works uh, wrote books on what we would call magic now, magic tricks, not, not um, anything occult. Paul McCready is the guy who invented the human-powered airplane, the Gossamer Albatross that today hangs in the Smithsonian Institute's Air and Space Museum. He was at my house once, and he was standing right here in front of uh, this wall of magic books, and he was looking, and he surprised me when he said, you know what, I think every high school in America should have a magic club. And I said, wow, really? Why? And he said, because schools don't teach kids how to think. Magic has the ability to make you actually stop, really think, and not only remember, but likely take to heart the message that is buried within it. There was a book I used to read to my daughter when she was little. It was about a little mouse and all the other mice. You know, they live in a little mouse colony. And all the other mice spend their whole summertime gathering grain and building a nest and, you know, preparing for the hard winter ahead. And Frederick would look at the sunshine, look at the colors. And he didn't seem to be really preparing for the winter. And but when it was winter time, the question is, does Frederick deserve to eat any of this grain? And, it turns out Frederick starts telling them about the sun that he watched. And, you know, he spins these tales about the sun and these beautiful colors and all these things that happen only in his head. I mean, they feel warmer and they feel f more full. And, you know, Frederick, it turns out, was contributing to the greater good. Entertainment affects every aspect of society and our understanding of the world. We go to a play, we come away completely changed people. We see a wonderful film and we go, my goodness, it completely blew my mind because it allows me to see the world and myself in a new way. It can have an effect on people and the world and it can change how people see the world and how they interact with the world. There's a, there's a sense in which our magic, magic by trickery, is very similar to the real thing, as it were, which is it, it reveals the universe to be beyond our ken. It's like that momentary glimpse into the vastness that surrounds us. Uh, it becomes a moment of clarity as to just how much we don't know. Well, magic is tremendously important. It's the oldest performing art. There's no question in my mind. It's earlier. It's, what, trying to be a wonder worker was something I'm sure that we did before we really rationalized music and understood music and any other form of acting. It's important the illusion. If you have no illusion, you can do a lot of things, and, but probably you don't want to 
do more and better is important. And if you think that the love is not important, illusion is not important, the dreams are not important, the poetry are not important, the happiness is not important, magic is not important. I think in our lives we need to, to see something that, that entertains us and makes us feel good and the, the wonderment of how, what's going on there? How is he doing that? That's one of my real attractions to magic is that I, I think to see things that seem so overwhelmingly impossible, you either have to go all the way to space or you have to see a really good magic trick. For real? Yeah, that's, yeah. Picasso said that everybody was born an artist and we're educated out of it. And I think maybe we're all born hardwired to appreciate magic. And then as we grow, we become more cynical and we're educated away from it. Yeah, I mean, I think as long as people are gonna wanna get out of their heads and experience that sense of wonder and mystery, magic is gonna be the perfect solution for that. It always will be. I think it has to be. What magic has the potential to do, and I'm not saying it's done it, but it has the potential to do is remind people that what they think is the case might be wrong. And that, in turn, should breed tolerance, understanding, humility. And those are generally conceived of as being good things. As long as human beings don't become somehow omniscient or omnipotent and know everything there is to know, there will be somebody that can entertain them with wonders. Magic's biggest secret is that it has nothing to do with tricks. We know, in practical terms, how to make you think what we want you to think. And the real secret to magic is that there is no magic except what happens inside your head. Once we understand the rules, we can get you to think almost anything, and therefore we can do almost anything. Is the love that you have for the art. And it's not even a secret, but I think that's the key, which I guess in a way is a secret. My perception is very, very limited and can be manipulated, and we do it every day. That's my job. Always face the audience. Great magic is better than sex and harder to find. I, I point out that I didn't say magic is better than sex, or that great magic is better than great sex, but great magic is better than sex and harder to find. Excuse me, I can I cannot talk about my sexual life. Magic's biggest secret is in my pants right now. It, I don't know, it's the Peter Pan syndrome. It's it's a way to lock in the life and never grow up. All the secrets that you need to know to know how all the tricks work, they're all in magic books. They're all behind me or they're all in the public library. There are those who would try to convince you that magic's biggest secret is that it really has no secrets. But its biggest secret is that that is false. There are secrets. Magic's biggest secret could be defined by uh, great visual artist Francis Bacon when he said, 
The artist's job is to always deepen the mystery. Magic's biggest secret is hidden within the pages of Dragon's Love Tacos, available on Amazon.com and at your local independent bookstore. Magic's biggest secret is it's a great way to meet women. It's true. That's how I met my wife. She was a volunteer from the audience. That's how you met your wife. I bet you, but you did a trick for her. You met your wife by doing a trick for her. I mean, we all meet people by doing magic tricks for them. There's still, there are still all secrets. The biggest secret in magic, I think, is the passion of magic from, to magic and the passion to people. You love magic, you love people, is the secret. No more secret, this must be true. I actually don't know what magic's biggest secret is. I actually do know. I take it back. I know exactly what magic's biggest secret is. Magic's biggest secret is that the magician points you towards magic and you are the one who makes the magic happen. That's magic's biggest secret. You know, magicians will have many, many different answers, and they are all lying to you. These are professional deceivers. The biggest secret in magic is... Magic's biggest secret is knowing how to wink. Magic's biggest secret is probably that it hides in plain sight every day. Howard Thurston said it, you can fool their eyes and you can fool their minds, but you cannot fool their hearts. The biggest secret in magic is that it's not actually crap. And never ever forget to always believe in yourself, which I probably said in the very beginning, but don't ever forget to believe in yourself.